Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with another episode of Check the Kick Podcast, SureDog.com. Devin, the host, flying solo again. Um, really busy work week for me. I got freaking jury duty next week, which sucks. Um, maybe I'll just tell them something crazy so I can get opted out. Either way, um, I was going to try to bring someone on, but I got super busy myself and, and I, I didn't want to really bring anyone on last moment. So here I am alone flying solo, um, coming up off of a pretty bad weekend of fights, but coming up on a great weekend of fights. Um, well, let, let's call it a great weekend once we get through the weigh-ins, but we're going to talk about some fights that are coming up this weekend. UFC 295. We got that UFC Sao Paulo card that we are going to look back on but for not that long because it was not good and let's just start it off um we'll, we'll rip through this as fast as possible guys i promise you don't want to listen to this i know you don't um because i nobody wanted to watch this fight play out the way it did um Dalton almeida dominates Derek lewis this is the first time Derek Lewis has been to decision in the UFC <clears throat> and Jalton 30, probably 35 pounds lighter than him. You know, he, he did what he had to do to take the win. This hurts me more than anybody because I had to watch this fight just like y'all did. But Jalton Almeida is also my sure dog fantasy MMA heavyweight draft pick. So yes, I accrued points. He won a main event. He should have finished. This was a gimme fight for him to finish. Um, the UFC flew Derek Lewis to the to Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo for Jelton Almeida to go out there and get a finish. Jelton Almeida took him down at will. Um, you know, it was kind of funny watching Derek Lewis. There were some scrambles, and Derek Lewis showed some okay takedown defense. Um, it, it was it was funny though the way Derek Lewis was kind of just punching at his ankles. Um, it, it looked like he had accidentally stepped in a red ant pile and he was just trying to swat these ants off of his legs. Either way, Jelson Almeida did what he had to do. I heard some scorecard from somewhere. I won't mention it, but they scored all 10, eight rounds, whatever. Regardless, I, I mean, Jelson Almeida is going to go home to his family with his show money, his win, his win bonus. He didn't win any fans with this. Um, People that are on the Jelton train, they might not be jumping off while it's moving, but maybe they're going to get off at the next stop. We will see what's up with him next. He called for Cyril gone. That fight kind of makes all the sense. Um, in the in the post fight, he said he wanted to entertain the Brazilian crowd and how it was a great performance. And it's like, dude, that was something that you obviously pre wrote because you expected to go out there and dominate Derek Lewis, but you just didn't. Um, and, and the fight was bad. <clears throat> you have all these, and I understand you're, you're 30 pounds lighter than Derek Lewis. He's a big, strong heavyweight. He has the ability to just stand up, but Frick, man, there was a, I think it was the end of the third round where he was landing ground and pound. And it's like, man, if you just continued to do that, like you could have got Derek Lewis out of there, Derek Lewis, I'm not going to call him a quitter, but if you show him the door, he'll walk out. You know, hey, here's there's the exit, Derek. All you have to do is punch him a lot. Like, yeah, in 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 Jalson's uh, Shamil Abdurakimov fight, he was like, I'm not going to submit this guy, so I'm just going to punch him a lot. Jelton has great ground and pound. He loves that Donkey Kong punch. He's trying to head an arm choke. You're not going to head an arm choke someone like Derek Lewis, man. Like, you need to just punch him and punch him and punch him and, and make him give up. And even if you lose... Even if he loses the position, Derek Lewis is very dangerous, and I understand he's you know main event at home in front of his family. You, you don't want to get shit kicked. You don't want to get obliterated. You don't want to be on the Derek Lewis highlight reel. But man, you could show that you can take him down again. He Jelton won every single grappling exchange, even when he got into a couple dicey positions in a couple places. Um, he he had what he, he he had what it takes to probably give some give some more ground and pound and maybe take a little bit more risks, but also continue to win those scrambles. And it's really one of those, like, yes, you're mitigating risk by staying in Mount controlling Derek, hitting him with little baby pepper shots. I, 
sidebar i've never seen um a ref warn a fighter for timidity and not enough action in full mount which should freaking say everything you need to know about this fight but again i'm on the fence when it comes to a situation where do you control somebody for five rounds and not take any damage because you're so controlling or do you go out there take a little bit more risks but get them out of there in two rounds and then the fight's done and Derek lewis goes home and you go home and that's it i i personally think it's almost probably safer to take a smaller risk with a larger reward by just getting the fight done if you can get Derek Lewis out of there in eight minutes instead of letting him hang around for 25, yeah, maybe you have to take a couple more risks and you you lose a scramble position and maybe you get hit with something that you don't want to get hit with. Derek Lewis could turn off anyone's lights with one shot. Ask Curtis Blades. I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's just a weird thing. Tell me what you guys think about it. Um, put it in the comments or shoot me a DM. There's my handle. Let me know um, if you were Johnson Almeida, if you would control Derek Lewis, or if you would just try to get him out of there. I mean, shit, if you would have got him out of there, he was teed up for a performance bonus here. Um, just a, a pretty interesting fight all around. I almost want to see the Curtis Blades fight, but for my points and the way that the Sherdog fantasy scoring criteria goes or the scoring system, um, I, it'll be best for Jelton to fight Cyril Gon because I will have a chance. To, it's a more winnable fight, in my opinion, um, just because Cyril Gon does have those deficiencies in that department. But Jelton did show he could stay composed and have good cardio and, and take down and continue to hold down and control someone that's as big as Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis is, is one of the biggest heavyweights on the roster. He's huge. He's no Dante Mays. Um, no, I'm not going to talk about that fight. Um, the rematch everyone wanted, but yeah, I'm on the fence about Jelton again. Tell me what you guys think too. put it down in the comments. We're going to just rip, rip on to the next fight here. Um, so stay tuned. Moving on to a fight that was a barn burner. It won fight of the night. I don't think it should have won fight of the night. I think this should have just been a flat out performance bonus. Co-main event, this is the true main event. Nicholas fucking Dalby, 38 years old, goes out there, gets into a wild brawl with the undefeated Gabriel Bonfim. We thought he was the better Bonfim brother. I just don't know about these Bonfims anymore. Are they front runners? I don't know. Uh, interesting. I'll just leave it at that. Um Bonfim goes out there and he's so explosive. He's powerful. He's athletic. But Dalby's a dude that just, yeah, he got knocked out by Ronson, but Ronson was on PEDs and that fight was overturned. Outside of that, he's never really got knocked out or, you know, he's had fights stopped due to blood <clears throat> over in Cage Warriors. But Dalby is a guy that, and Keith from Sherdog kind of made a really good comparison. He's kind of like a, a, I don't want to say poor man's Bilal, but you know, kind of a similar style to a Bilal Muhammad where they're just good at everything. Dalby may be even more of a dog than Bilal Muhammad. Dalby's a freaking dog, guys. He went out there, got into a brawl with Bonfim, got taken down, survived a submission. The second round started. Bonfim took, you know, tried to take him down again, started putting, really tried to put the screws to Dalby. And I don't know if Bonfim just didn't do the tape study for this, but he had a path to victory, which was to really just lean on his grappling and try to bank two rounds, um, getting top control and maybe threatening submissions. But Dalby's just too tough. Dalby was landing exchanges in the pocket. There was a couple prior to the <clears throat> finishing sequence. Um, he forced Gabriel on the back foot and started hitting him just with some clean shots down the pike. And you could see Gabriel start looking around like the moment got to him. This guy's not out of here yet. And then they got into the clinch and Dalby just started landing these knees. And th after the first knee landed, it looked like Bonfim was breathing through a straw. Um, and it looked like he saw a ghost. Dalby landed a couple more knees and he just face planted him, finished him with ground and pound, took his O away. Dalby was the biggest underdog on this card. He is the 
this guy goes to Brazil and he kills these Brazilian fighters. He, all the adversity that the fans were against him, they were screaming, you will die in Portuguese. Bonfim, this, this was in Bonfim's head. He probably thought it was just taking a lamb to slaughter. And, and Dalby went out there and did everything right. Even in the beginning where, and, and I understand Bonfim's game. And I even put this into the Slack chat <clears throat> that if, even if Bonfim wins this fight, um, just brawling with people at welterweight is going to cost him eventually. And it ended up costing him in this fight due to his gas tank, him not being extremely defensive, really responsible. And I don't want to call him a front runner. We'll have to see with his next fight. Um, but Dolby was willing to trade in the pocket with them. Dolby took, took his best shots and was willing to just get on the front foot whenever he had the opportunity grind him against the cage, get into the clinch, continue the forward pressure, throw straight shots. And and Bonfim landed clean shots on him, but Dalby was just unfazed. He's a dude that's super tough, and you literally have to kill him for him to die. He's not just going to go away. Um, he's been hurting fights. Muslim Salikov hurt him. People hurt him, but he just does not go away. And he has not had a finish. I believe it's Dalby's first finish in the UFC, and he looked great doing it. His biggest win. This got fight of the night. Bonus. I think Dolby should have just flat out got a performance bonus. I think the uh, Hinaf Fakhardinov and Ale- Aleski Dos Santos fight, that's a tongue twister of a name, should have got fight of the night. That was a draw with both dudes hurt each other. Um, yeah, that fight was freaking awesome. Um, Dolby, man, he's 38. He's about to be 39. And like, he's just still doing things. Um, this dude, if he keeps fighting Brazilians in Brazil, like he's going to be on his way to a, a title fight, uh, which is just funny. Like, obviously, he's not on his way to a title fight, but you know what? Like, give him another Brazilian. Let him fight RDA. I think RDA and Dolby would be a great fight because they're both just dogs. It could be a co main out on a fight night again. Dolby deserves it after that. Um, even he he was super nice and sweet to the Brazilian crowd, which is really awesome. He's like, yeah, I know you guys didn't want to see me beat up your boy, but Brazil's great. I love it here. Um, and, and, and he wants to keep winning. We'll talk a little bit about Bonfim. He, um, I, I have a better idea of his style now where he is so big and so athletic and, and it is such a regional MMA style. Like, it totally makes sense that he was icing dudes in the LFA where he would just have these big, these brawls with people where he would rely on his durability and rely on his speed and athleticism and power, force them to just panic in a brawl, force them to make mistakes, try to avoid the brawl using grappling. That's why he's hitting that guillotine choke the way he does. He's got a great guillotine, force a crazy brawl, you panic, you make a hit with some shit, and then you go to shoot a bad takedown shoot a takedown with your head inside boom sinks up the guillotine and, and it's and it's done um i said in the shirt dog slack that bond theme cannot continue to just brawl with people at this weight class there are dudes that will bite down on brawl with him you know and these are guys that are outside the rankings like i like a joaquin buckley you, you probably don't want to get into a firefight with someone like him because it turns 50 50 you know, um, tons of tons of dudes in that weight class. And then if you start marching up the rankings, um, there's just tons of guys there that you that are technical and they can brawl. And I, I just thinking about Bonfim, you know, say he goes out there and if he would have got this this win against Dolby, then what? He he gets matched up against someone like Jeff Neal, you know? Oh, I hate to uh, you know, go and get into a brawl with Jeff Neal and see what happens. Um you get knocked out with a style like that. So hopefully he can go back to the drawing board. And this is just a, these bond theme brothers were freaking shooting to the stars. And then now all of a sudden they are, I mean, Ismail bond theme. He, he got into the UFC, <clears throat> super impressive knockout over Terrence McKinney. Great performance. Hits him with a jump knee to the neck head area after kind of beating him up pretty bad face plants. him. wonderful, beautiful performance. And then he goes and, and fights a guy that's really good in uh, Benoit Saint-Denis. He was a favorite. Saint-Denis was an underdog. Came in and 
got finished via net crank and kind of, I don't want to say embarrassed, but you know, the hype train was people were like, shit, Terrence McKinney's really good. Look at this Ismail Bonfim guy. He looked good on the contender series. Now, you know, him and his brother, they're, they're great fighters. <clears throat> he doesn't, Ismail didn't really have losses to anyone, you know, bad, even outside of the UFC he had losses like Hanato Moicano, whatever. Cool. He takes one loss and then he gets, a, he gets a turnaround fight. The UFC is like, Hey, we're going to give you Vince Pichel a janitor that's 40 you're going to fight him at home you have one job make the fucking weight and that's a gimme fight for you dude can't make weight blows it on the scale so you go from violent finish over terrence mckinney lost to benoit saint denis via finish and now you can't even make it to the scale it's just a, it's just a tough look um it's not good for them and then the older brother Biggest favorite on the card goes and gets finished by the biggest underdog on the card. Um, just tough going for these guys. Moving on to the middle segment of the show, what's hot? Finally, finally, freaking finally, we have big fights getting announced the day I want to record this show. Usually it happens the day after. Thank the MMA gods. Thank Dana White. Maybe Dana White's in cahoots with the MMA gods. Either way, breaking news, big fights, pay-per-views for 2024. There's some real good shit. Like, I'm happy. Um, we have four fight announcements that I want to talk to you guys about. Um, one of them is a non-title fight, but that's going to be UFC 297 on January 20th, we have Jan Blachowicz versus Alexander Rakic, number two. We all know the way that that fight ended due to a Rakic injury. Um, and that should be a great fight. It was a pretty good fight. Jan Blachowicz is always in pretty much fun fights, and he can kind of say the same thing about Alexander Rakic. Um, not a lot to talk about the fight, but it is an important fight. It's important for the division. Alexander Rakic is coming off a very long layoff due to that injury. Jan Blachowicz had a weird fight, very close fight with Alex Pajera, who we're going to be talking about here in a little bit. Um, and either way, it's just a great fight. little tidbit on that. Uh, moving on to title fights, fights that matter, fighters we all like. We have also... On that UFC 297 card, this just got released today. We have Sean Strickland defending his belt against Drikas Duplessis. This is the fight to make. Um, and these are the actual best two guys in the division, probably, if you don't count Bo Nickel. There you go, Keith. Um, Sean Strickland just went out there and cleanly kind of shit kicked Israel Adesanya and Drikas did the same thing to Robert Whitaker. And it's crazy because a year and a half ago, a year ago, if, if I told you that Sean Strickland went out there and almost finished Israel Adesanya and really put the screws to him and had him out of sorts. And then I told you Drikas Duplessis went out there and did the same exact thing to Robert Whitaker, but actually finished Robert Whitaker, out grappled him, out struck him, finished him with strikes. Um, you guys would be calling me crazy. Me saying that just sounds crazy, but we've got Sean Strickland defending his middleweight title. You guys can probably go to some fight odds website and find new odds on this. I don't have them. Feel free to go look them up. I'm going to assume Drikas is going to be the favorite because Sean Strickland is a guy that's kind of been undervalued um, by the odds makers. But this should be a great fight. Um, Drikas just kind of enters the pocket. He's a huge, strong middleweight. He has very underrated grappling and, and big, powerful striking. And Sean Strickland is as crazy as he is outside of the octagon and all the crazy things he said. He's actually a true technician, um, which is funny. He's like an actual martial artist. Like he has good striking, great defense. Honestly, uh, outside of the uh, knockout by Alex Pajera, kind of impeccable defense, especially at middleweight. Good clean boxing, good straight punches. And it, in a weird way, a, a guy like Sean Strickland, that's just, I don't want to call him nuts and bolts, but a guy that's very put together and very technical and defensively sound, 
can be a potential crypt, kryptonite for Drikus Duplessis. And the same for Drikus, a guy that is just a, or same for Sean, you know, a guy in Drikus who is just a war hammer, who is, is a battering ram, who's going to continue to just go, 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 and, and not care what you put on him. Um, this could be a great fight. If the fight goes five rounds, I kind of favor Strickland just because we haven't seen Drikus do that in the UFC. But man, Drikus could go out there, take this dude down. And I mean, look at the way he passed Robert Whitaker's guard. He just flattened him. Um, incredible fight. Great fight. The next fight that'll be UFC 298. So this will be one month later in February, unannounced date. But we have Alexander Volkanovsky returning to flyweight to defend his title against Ilya Topuria. That's a good fucking fight, guys. It's the best. It's the best fight, in my opinion, out of all these fight announcements. It's um, a guy in Volk that, you know, may be on the decline right in front of our eyes. And he definitely peaked at a little bit of an older age. Um, against a guy in Ilya Topuria who is young, streaking, and good. Ilya is good, good, who also happens to be my 145 pound. Sure dog fantasy MMA pick, pick person, whatever. Um, you know, before Volk getting plainly just shit kicked by Islam in the rematch on short notice and getting knocked out pretty brutally. Um, I'd be all over Volk probably, but man, that knockout, Topuria's power, Topuria's ground game, Topuria's fearlessness in the pocket and willingness to train, to trade, willing to get on the front foot. He was so slick against Josh Emmett, scored a 10-7 round against Josh Emmett. That's an incredible fight. Both of these guys are incredible fighters. And I'm glad <clears throat> for Max Holloway, I'm glad he didn't have to fight an Ilya Topuria because it, it, it works out. It really works out for both these guys because Max does have all the skills and abilities to probably beat someone like Topuria. And that just takes the, the fight away from all of us. And for Max, like Max got beat up pretty bad against Volk in their third fight. And, you know, I, I like to see Max maybe do some stuff at 155. Either way, um, incredible fight between those two guys. And then the third fight, probably the biggest star out of all these guys, UFC 299 in March will headline will be headlined by Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto Vera. Um, that's going to be crazy. I am not surprised that this fight was made. <clears throat> it is a what would seem to be just immediate thought. Oh, that's a very winnable fight for Sean O'Malley. Um, a guy like Cheeto can potentially be the kryptonite for somebody like Sean O'Malley. Um, and there's a lot of tough matchups at, at 135 for O'Malley. Like we saw his fight with Petrion, regardless on how you scored it. Very, very close. Two more rounds of that. That's a five round title fight. Who knows? if Sean O'Malley wins that fight and who knows if Petrion wins that fight, but th there's guys like Marab and Marab seems to be come a guy that's almost, you know, he's putting himself in that Francis Ngannou box with the UFC where he is, you know, being hard to match make with supposedly there's a fight between him and Cejudo coming up. That's going to be a number one contender fight. Um, Corey Sandhagen's another guy that's very, I mean, Bantamweight's the best division in my opinion. Um, guys like, Corey Sandhagen, Song Yadong just got matched up in a fight. All those guys are potential threats to and to someone like Sean O'Malley. But Cheeto, Cheeto already has that win over him. It, it wasn't a fluke. He kicked the leg, the perennial nerve issue, and got on top and finished him with elbows. But the reason why I say someone like Cheeto, even though he's a guy that has taken some losses, he was on a good win streak. Like what he did to Rob Font was incredible close fight with Jose Aldo, you know, yeah, he did kind of get schooled by Corey Sandhagen, but a guy like a guy in Sean O'Malley that wants to, he wants to be a back foot counter puncher, but he will also take the front foot. A guy that wants to go out there and hurt people with perfectly placed 
one punch, um, you know, kind of what he did to Aljo, like in a perfect, in, in Sean O'Malley's perfect fights, all of his fights would look like his fight with Aljamain Sterling. He would go out there, cut an angle, take the back foot and fire something straight down the pike and knock you out. Problem is, nobody hurts Cheeto. Not only do they not hurt him, they don't, like he doesn't even get cut. It's very weird. In his fight with Rob Font, for example, Rob Font landed like over 100 more significant strikes than Cheeto did. Rob Font looked like he was drugged behind a horse and Cheeto didn't look like he was in a fight. I've never even seen him with a black eye. Like he'll do post-fight interviews with big media members that I won't say. Um, he won't even have a black eye. It's incredible. Um, and he is also a guy that is venomous, dangerous, super, super durable, has five round cardio and can hurt you in any moment. And we've seen Sean O'Malley hurt in fights. Petrion hurt him. Um, he could tee off on Cheeto the same way he teed off on someone like Chris Moutinho. And then Cheeto could hit him with a hook kick and he's dead. So that's a, that's a great fight. Um, a dynamic fight with two dynamic strikers, a very, very fun fight. The opportunity for Sean O'Malley to get that one back. Um, and what seems like a potentially easy title defense, but sneakily, I think it's a little more difficult than we all think. And Cheeto, quite frankly, probably doesn't deserve this fight due to his loss to Corey Sanhagen. But Cheeto's fun. The story's there. He has the win via finish over Sean O'Malley. And I get it. It's a fight business, you know. Um, the UFC is not a meritocracy. You you need to, it's a meritocracy up to a point. You, you need to get, you need to earn your way into the title picture, but then you can do other things to earn the title fight. So you have to strategically place yourself within like the top five of the division, in my opinion, and then you can do some other outside of the octagon things to maybe get you that fight. And that's what Cheeto's done. Good for him. Cheeto will talk that shit with Sean O'Malley. Sean O'Malley will talk that shit back. They were already on some other weird guy's um, talk show. Won't say his name. And he was interviewing Sean. And then he Cheeto picked up the phone and called the guy. And they did a FaceTime. It, it was it was funny good stuff um but some really great fights um i gotta talk to you guys about stuff like that when it breaks i will break news on suredog.com if stuff like this happens in the future but it just happened earlier today and i'm recording now so there it is um and if you guys haven't heard about these fights let me know what you think down in the comments Moving on to the final segment of the show. And with the new, we got a damn good, damn good UFC card coming up this weekend. UFC 295. It is headlined by Yuri Prohaska fighting for the vacant light heavyweight strap against Alex Poatan. Pereira, Pereira, however you say it. Um, I got three fights to talk to you guys about here. Three absolute effing bangers. First one we're going to talk about is Benoit, the god of war, St. Denis, France's own, versus Matt, the steamroller, Frivola, New York's own. This fight's going to be in NYC. So this is a home field advantage fight for Frivola. Um, odds on this fight... St. Denis is a pretty heavy favorite. He's coming in at minus 225. Matt Frivola comes back at plus 190. Um, and Matt Frivola, you know, in 2021, he lost the decision to Armin Sarukian. And then in June of that year, he lost via seven-second knockout to Terrence McKinney. Terrence McKinney's debut, took the fight on short notice, goes out there, throws a one-two, pop out and just knocks him out kind of hurts him right then and there right in the middle of the octagon big moment for terrence mckinney we like terrence mckinney here on this show great for him but after that he went and strung he strung together three wins all via finish Hanaro valdez yeah not a big win um wins via knockout great the Amina zaitar Amina zaitar was undefeated yes he left he had the whole potato incident over on Fight Island, whatever, knocks him out. Amina Zaitar was undefeated, like I said, and was knocking dudes the F out up until then. 
Ottman came in with a receding hairline and got knocked the F out. His most impressive and his best win on his record by far was in his last fight against Drew Dober, where Drew Dober was kind of doing his typical thing and trying to pressure and land big power against the octagon. And Matt Frivola stepped in and landed a beautiful counter and knocked Drew Dober the F out. Matt Frivola is a guy that he trains at a great gym. The Ray Longo gym over there with Matt Sarah, Sarah Longo. That's a great camp. Those guys are great at formulating game plans. They're not a huge team. They do really, really well together. They, they, they will take what you're good at and build off of it and string together game plans. Look what they've done for guys like Aljamain Sterling, Marab Dabalashvili, Chris Weidman, the list goes on. <laughs> um, and this is a really big fight and a big opportunity for really both these guys. This is a fight for a ranking. I, I do believe the UFC has Matt Frivola ranked inside the top 15. And Benoit St. Denis, on the other hand, is coming in off of a four fight win streak he all of his wins all of his wins come via finish he's got a record of 12 wins and one loss Matt Frivola has 11 wins three losses so they don't have deep deep MMA record or deep deep MMA you know careers these guys aren't 30 45 veterans but the only loss Benoit Saint Denis has was up a weight class on short notice against Alessia Zaleski Dos Santos. He got really shit kicked in that fight. That fight was tough to watch. That was something that the corner should have stopped. If you want a perfect example of where in a corner should probably stop a fight was that fight. But he hung tough, came back, got a rear naked choke over Nicholas Stolse, came back again and knocked out Gabe, Gabriel Miranda. His most I don't know if it was his most impressive win, but he was an underdog. Went out there and submitted via face crank Ismail Bonfim. That was earlier this year. And then just a couple months ago in September, he went out there and knocked out Tiago Moises. Benoit is streaking. He looks good. He is good everywhere. He is big and powerful for this division. He is a little bit hittable, but he, he's a guy that will take a licking you know, he, he will walk down his opponents. He will try to land big volume, big power, but he's a good grappler. That's his thing. You know, prior to the UFC, a lot of his wins all really came by submission. Um, and could he walk on to a big counter? Matt Frivola does have the ability to line up big, powerful counter punches, especially if you walk in on him. That's how he got Ottman as Itar. That's how he got Drew Dober. And I bet his team is doing the tape to watch Benoit because Benoit is a guy that is very hittable. Um, I have to lean Benoit St. Denis here. I think St. Denis is just a little bit more durable than Frivola. They both have equal power. I think Frivola does a better job at setting up his counter punches and is better at delivering punches, you know, I guess like you could say on a timely manner. He's better at timing those punches and delivering them when they need to be given. Benoit is much more of a athlete, get in your face, athlete fighter, get in your face, rough you up, take you down, try to hurt you. Benoit just wants to punish you everywhere. I think also St. Denis is streaking a little bit more here. That's the reason why he's he's such a big favorite against a guy like Frivola, who is, is, a, is a true UFC vet. I'm going to go St. Denis. I don't know how this, I don't have a, I don't have a, idea on how this fight goes St. Denis could th these guys could knock each other out both of them have the ability to do so I'm going to lean with St. Denis to maybe get a late second round submission though um, maybe or by decision um, either way really great fight moving on to the second to last fight we're going to talk about guys it's the big boys it's the big boys we have Tommy Aspinall versus Sergei Pavlovich. The Russian versus the Brit. Aspinall, slight favorite, minus 123. Pavlovich is coming back in as the slight dog, plus 103. These are going to switch flop. This is a pick em fight to me. I don't know how the F this fight goes down. This fight's fucking awesome. This is a better fight than John Jones and Stipe. And if you ask me... 
both of these guys are probably better than them. And, and you, you guys are going to probably eat me alive in the comments. You know, send me to hell. Pavlovich got out wrestled, got out wrestled and, and, and beat up pretty bad by Overeem. Look, do you, do you guys want me to go to SureDog.com and tell you about John Jones's record real quick? Because we can. We could do it. We can if you want. John Jones has one good win. There's a three-year difference between the Dominic Reyes fight and the Ciro Gon fight. John Jones lost to Dominic Reyes. I don't care what this says. I don't care what the SureDog.com says. He lost to Dominic Reyes. And you know what? We can go to July 6th of 2019 when I scored the Tiago Santos fight for Tiago Santos. In my opinion, John Jones was coming off of two losses before he fight before he fought Cyril Gon. Oh, want me to tell you who he fought prior to then? Gus Alexander Gustafsson in 2018. Gus was washed and looking like shit. And Anthony Smith in 2019. Um, John Jones is fighting once per year. And then he came back and did in impressive fashion get that guillotine choke over Cyril Gon. But we also watched Francis Ngannou out wrestle Cyril Gon. Pavlovich and Tom Aspinall have the shortest fight time in the UFC. Aspinall is the number one record keep record keeper for that, and Pavlovich is the third. Um, I don't know who number two is. It's some schmuck. Um, these dudes are dangerous. They're young. There's a reason why John Jones was not fighting one of these two dudes because these two dudes could have been fights. There's a reason why he was fighting a 43 year old Stipe Miocic. John Jones is not dumb. He understands where he was. He can watch the tape and look at those fights. There's no way he could honestly score that Dominic Reyes fight for himself. It's really tough to do that. Um, that's my John Jones rant. John Jones is a great fighter, all time great, one of the best to ever do it, probably the best to ever do it. But today, on November 6th of 2023, I do believe Sergey Pavlovich and Tom Aspinall are better heavyweights than John Jones, and I would die on that hill. Um, these guys are both good. These guys are both really, really good. Um, and, and both of them are streaking. Both of them are hurting people. Sergey Pavlovich, he did lose to Overeem on his debut. That was 2018. He was very young at that time. After that, 2019, Killed Marcelo Golm. Oh, what happened? Killed Maurice Green after that, which is John Jones's buddy, main training partner, the dude that defended a takedown and caused John Jones to blow up his shoulder. After that, oh, who did he knock out? Derek Lewis. Who did he knock out after that? Ty Tui Boston. Who did he knock out after that? Curtis Blades. He is a sharp boxer with fast hands, decent footwork, great at pressuring, super durable, composed in the pocket, and is willing to take one to give one. And... He is kind of just like a higher volume, straighter puncher, Russian version of Nganu. He touches you and you die. Um, and he's a guy that's really, really coming into, you know, his best. He's only got one loss on his record, and that was to Alistair Overeem. Outside of that, he has beaten everyone else. Moving on to Tom Aspinall. He did lose via that, that knee injury to Curtis Blades. The knockout or the TKO elbows against Marcin Tayaburo was super, super impressive. That straight arm bar he got against Volkov where he just walked him down, took him down, and ripped his arm off, super impressive again. He rear naked choked Andrei Olovsky. That, like, stepping elbow he got over Sergei Spivak, awesome. Yeah, he beat Jake Collier, you know, beat Alan Bado, whatever. These guys, Aspinall is another dude that is a very good BJJ practitioner. That's what he comes from. He's a high-level wrestler, high-level BJJ, very, very fast. His ability to get into the pocket, exchange, he leaps into the pocket, lands what he wants to land, and usually people don't usually people don't get to have another say after that. He hurts people, he's very, very quick, and he has a great submission game. And he could potentially expose Pavlovich here. One thing, you know, watching a little bit of tape on this, um, Aspinall is a guy that will rely on his speed to enter and exit the pocket. He has great boxing, good kicks, fast, crisp hands, but he really leaves his chin up in the air, which is something I don't like. The loss to Derek Blade, Derek Blades, Curtis Blades, when he blew up his knee, 
he leapt into the pocket and all Curtis Blades did was boom, boom, fire a one, two straight down the pike. And that landed very clean on Aspinall. And then Aspinall kind of, you know, stepped back, landed on his leg weird and blew up his knee. But Curtis Blades is a guy that was just willing to say, okay, if you're going to leap into the pocket and exchange with me, I'm just going to stand my ground and throw straight punches. And I'm going to, I'm going to hit you back. Pavlovich has the ability to do that. Um, I really am concerned about Aspinall's the way Aspinall leaves his chin up in the air. He just seems hittable and Pavlovich seems to be a guy that is just like a Terminator where it doesn't go look at his brawl with Ty to Ivasa. Like he is just brawling with Ty cracking him, staying calculated. He faints the level change and it comes up over the top and kind of crushes Tuiv also behind the ear. His Pavlovich is striking like he's his power jab. He's dropping people with a power jab. All week going into this fight, once this fight was announced, this fight was announced on short notice. I think it's like 10 or 12 days. They're fighting for the interim title because John Jones did get injured. Um, and I know I shit on John Jones. John Jones is great. He, he's an incredible talent, but as the underdog, Pavlovich, you, I feel like if you're a betting man, you just take whatever person of these two is at a plus number, to be quite frank with you guys. But something tells me Sergei Pavlovich, I, I, the, the Curtis Blades fight, was, it was over in 15 seconds. It's literally 15 seconds. But that 15 seconds to me is almost more telling than all of the other fights and it's it's a tendency of leaping into the pocket being really really quick usually usually aspinall can kind of shock people with his speed and his ability to enter the pocket and land crisp shots look what he did to sergey pavlovich sergey spivak sorry jumped into the pocket boom elbow crushed him with it but pavlovich is just gonna meet him there and pavlovich is super durable if aspinall is leaping into the pocket like that with his head up on the center line pavlovich is gonna catch him I think Pavlovich is going to win this fight by knockout. I don't know why. I just have a feeling. Give me Sergey Pavlovich, round one knockout. He is the interim heavyweight champion. And I had no idea. I, I take my notes. I document things. I have an idea, but like something's just telling me Sergey Pavlovich. It's Sergey by knockout. In the comments, y'all, tell me what you think because th this is a freaking banger of a fight. Ladies and gentlemen. We have the main event. Main event of UFC 295. Big fight. Huge fight. One of the first times that I can remember where the heavyweights are not taking precedence over these guys, but we got heavyweight, light heavyweight. All these guys are big names, but we have Yuri Prohashka fighting Alex Poatan Pereira. Alex is a slight favorite, minus 125. Yuri's coming back at plus 105. This is another pick em fight. These odds are going to freaking move around throughout the week. I'm recording this Monday night. Y'all are going to listen to this Tuesday morning, hopefully. Um, and th this, by the time you guys are listening to this, these odds could change. Um, and this this is just an incredible fight. Alex Pajera is my 205 Sure Dog Fantasy MMA pick. Um, I picked him after he beat Jan Blachowicz. I love Jan Blachowicz, by the way, one of my one of my guys. Against Yuri, um, Yuri is just a whirling dervish. Two guys that, quite frankly, have two completely different styles. Yuri Prohashka is a defenseless whirling dervish of a crazy ginormous athlete. He's six foot four, could be even bigger. Hits like a truck crazy spinning elbows does everything he is just a, an incredible talent um his and what's crazy is all of his fights in the ufc he's only got three he knocked out vulcan uzdemir he admitted to being knocked out in that fight getting flash knocked out waking back up dominic reyes had him in all sorts of trouble glover Teixeira had him in all sorts of trouble multiple times in that fight lost that fight because he jumped on a freaking choke after having Yuri hurt a billion times. Yuri is a guy that is, he, he does not care 
about defense. His game is to walk for. He is a Tasmanian devil of a fighter. He's a giant man. He's a little bit crazy. If you watch his training footage, he is doing some sort of like eye training. I don't know what to call it. It's he's like standing on one foot, looking at a bunch of like weird figures in a book with an eye patch on in the middle of the woods with like a yoga mat duct tape to a tree. He's fucking nuts. It's awesome. Um, after he won the belt, he went and like locked himself in a dark room for three days to like meditate and think about what just happened. <laughs> Crazy. Um, the <laughs> You guys need to look this up. There is a clip of him in the post fight press conference after he beat Glover for the belt and he's wearing this like full on samurai. I, I don't want to be disrespectful because I don't know what it's called. Um, but some sort of like Japanese robe and he's speaking and then the lights go out and he's like, uh, he's kind of like glowing cause it's kind of shiny. And it's just like, he literally looks like a, like a, a superhero or super villain. He he's incredible. Um, moving on to Alex Pajero. What a fucking, um, what a combat sports athlete period Two division champion in glory kickboxing. He was just inducted to the glory hall of fame. And there's like three people in the glory kickboxing hall of fame comes into the UFC goes on a kill streak, goes beats Israel Adesanya for like their third, for like the third or fourth time, whatever finishes him, And you know, has a, has a, a fourth fight with Izzy gets knocked out by Izzy. And then it's like, Hey, you know what? I'm done at, at 185 after, especially after Izzy got beat up pretty bad by Sean goes to 205 at elevation in Salt Lake city has a weird fight with Jan Blachowicz, wins the fight. And a win against Jan Blachowicz, one of the highest dudes in the division. Remember what I was talking about a little bit ago when I said all you need to do is get yourself into the top five of a division and other things can happen to put you into a title fight? Well, former champion, absolute killer, huge name. That's how you get a title fight. And there's some buried storylines here. Glover Teixeira is Alex, Alex Pajera's head coach, number one training partner. He's his protege. He looks up to Glover. Glover literally helped him move his whole family to the United States of America. They live together, train together. They sit at the same dinner table. Yuri took Glover's belt in a very, very close fight. So this is probably one he wants to get back for his, um, his, you know, his predecessor, his, you know, master or whatever you could say. Um, Alex looked good too against against um, Jan Blachowicz. Jan Blachowicz has pretty good wrestling, pretty good BJJ. He is a black belt, and he was able to escape some things at elevation, still land combinations, and he was landing on landing on Jan Blachowicz. Jan Blachowicz is a super tough fighter. He's really really good. When Jan Blachowicz was streaking and he knocked out Dominic Reyes for the vacant two hundred five belt, um, he would give someone like these two. And Jan Blachowicz is older now, but he would give someone like these guys a problem. Um, Jan Blachow and Alex Pajera, sorry, is a guy that is just, he's dynamic. I don't want to call him nuts and bolts, but compared to Yuri, he is much more of a put together tactician, tactful fighter. His left hook is probably the, I mean, I, I sent a video of it to my boss and I was like, man, look at this guy's left hook. It doesn't look hard and he just buries people. There is a, um, highlight clip going around of all these Alex Pajero knockouts between MMA and kickboxing. And it's just like jump switch knees, head kicks, left hooks, overhand rights. Politon means stone hands. And there's not probably a more fitting name, nickname or persona in MMA. And Alex Pajero is just like a stone cold killer. He's this like, brazilian jungle warrior so we got this like warrior versus samurai crazy backstory these guys totally deserve to be the main event once john jones fell out this got promoted to the main event and this is a great fucking fight yuri's gonna really have to lean on his wrestling he did submit he did submit glover yuri is a guy that you have to kill this guy he he can take so much damage he's so so durable and he is just crazy he will do things he will literally hold his gloves and put his head down and kind of try to bait you in. He'll pressure you, watch you cut an angle, throw a spinning elbow and knock you out. Look what he did to Dominic Reyes. 
Um, Alex Pereira is definitely there. These guys are both heavy handed and are both dynamic finishers and both dynamic strikers. Alex Pereira definitely is the more dangerous striker out of these two. But I always felt like Alex Pereira was not the he's pretty defensively sound, but he's not the most durable guy. He can get buzzed and clipped up in fights. We've seen him get hurt. He's been hurt multiple times against Izzy. And yes, this is up a division, so his durability should stick. He did get punched a bunch from Jan Blachowicz. However, these, that fight was at elevation, so you really need to take that fight with a grain of salt. Doing tape study for that fight, those two dudes were, both looked like they were like fighting in a room with like extra gravity. Um, so it's hard, to, it's hard to use that uh, as a barometer for measurement on Alex Pereira and Jan Blachowicz today. Um, Alex is just so dangerous. Yuri's going to really need to wrestle and grapple, but Glover is probably the best training partner to have if you're a 205er and you want to learn how to wrestle, grapple, and anti-grapple because Glover's double leg, super strong top side game is probably the top three that's ever been in that division, top five at least. Glover is very, very high level wrestling and BJJ practitioner and a very good top side controlled grappler. And he has probably taken Alex Pajara down a million times. And again, I just think that's a great training partner to have for Yuri. Like, what does his camp look like? Who knows? The guy is just crazy. Um, I have to lean Alex Pajara here. Breaking down a, a Yuri Prohaska fight is so strange because you just don't know what this guy is going to do. He has the ability to do so many weird dynamic things when it comes to his striking, but he also is, I mean, he's just very defensively porous. Every single person he's fought in the UFC has had him on queer street and hurt multiple times. Dominic Reyes is a great athlete. He's a hard puncher. Vulcan Uzdemir is a good athlete. He's a hard puncher. Glover Teixeira is a, a great fighter, legend, hard puncher. None of these guys are the... I mean, Yuri, Yuri takes one step into the pocket and Alex Pajara touches him with that left hook and four-ounce gloves. Yuri's been hurt. I could see him getting hurt. I could see Alex Pajara knocking him out. And I could also see Alex Pajara, you know, getting clipped up with something himself. This is going to be a super, super good fight. I'm going to be at the edge of my seat for this one. Give me Alex Pajara by second round knockout. I think he hurts Yuri with some sort of left hook, and Yuri goes staggering back, and then I think he gets him with the jumping switch knee. I love how Alex Pajara uses his hands to set up his knees and his kicks. That's something he's really good at. And if you get hurt in front of him, that jumping scissor knee that he throws, he's done it in glory. He's done it here against Andres Mikalidis. I could see him totally doing that to Yuri. Give me Alex Pereira to be a two-division champion with like 10 MMA fights. Getting Glover Teixeira in his corner with a smile from ear to ear. He said he wants to take Glover's belt back to him. This is going to be a good fight, guys. Um, thank you so much for listening to the show. That's the sign. Check the kick podcast. SureDog.com. I'm Devin. That's my handle. Follow me on the socials, Twitter, IG, all those things. Listen to the other Sherdog sure shows. They're, these guys are great. They're better than I am. You got Ben Duffy. We got Keith Schillen. A bunch of really good shows. Go to Sherdog.com. Click the little podcast thing. Go on there. Go to YouTube. Subscribe. Like, do all the shit that I hate telling you guys to do. Thank you so much. Enjoy the fights.